Good morning, Faith Church. My name is uh, Joseph Shimko. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Church, and it's a privilege and an honor to be able to help um, uh, just to be on staff here to, to be one of your ministers. Uh, I just want to celebrate. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, uh, a day to celebrate the beginning of the church, day of Pentecost. So happy Pentecost. And we want to just encourage you today to get out your bulletins, to look at some important announcements and some some things in order to be the church, to be about the church, and to, not just to, to do the church things, but to, to really embody what the Holy Spirit is doing in your own life so it overflows into our community. I want to encourage you to look at the bulletin and see what ways that you can be the church to those that are right beside you or, or those that uh, you may have chance encounters this week. Uh, I want to encourage you to fill out your, your Connect card that's in that bulletin. Take the time to be able to let us know what God's doing in your life. Uh, any updated information that you want to give to us, we'd love for you to be able to update that information. And for those that are online, just want to welcome you for taking. The, thank you for taking the time to, for worshiping with us here at Faith Church. There's some important announcements that Jim Anthony is going to share in our video, so I just want you to make note of those as we begin our worship time. Hi, Jim Anthony here. Welcome to worship, and congratulations once again to all the graduates. Baptism will take place during worship on June 26th. Pastor Larry will be slinging water right and left. So, hit your connect card or contact the church office. Let them know if you or your kids are interested. VBS will be here before you know it. Another week or so, actually. Believe it or not. We're still in need of crew leaders and always donations are helpful. Check out the VBS bulletin board in the Fairview Drive Wing or check online or in your bulletin for more information. Finally, mark your calendars at the end of Vacation Bible School during the celebration on Sunday, June 26th, following the 945 worship service. We're going to be having a big party to celebrate. We're having bouncy houses. We're having food trucks. Taco Bills will be here. Little Miss Cupcake and Whoopie Pies will be here. Save me a couple of those. And everyone's invited. Bring some friends. Hang out. Celebrate the end of EBS and just fun and fellowship. And let's get ready to worship. Thank you, Jim. Let's go ahead and stand for our call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, the wind of God, the breath of life. Come, Holy Spirit, for our advocate, our counselor. Come, Holy Spirit, teacher of wisdom, reminder of Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, may we feel God breathing through our worship. May we receive the Holy Spirit in this place. Amen. Let's remain standing for our first hymn, O Spirit of the Living God.
God of grace, you sent the promised gift of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and the women, upon Mary, the mother of Jesus, and upon his brothers. Fill your church with power, kindle flaming hearts within us, and cause us to proclaim your mighty works in every time, that all may call upon you and be saved. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's greet one another in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith Church.
morning, Faith Church. Good morning. I am Larry Leland, and I am also blessed to be one of the pastors here, and um, I am grateful to be here on this day as we celebrate Pentecost, the birth of the church, as we celebrate our graduates, as we look forward to all that God has in store for their lives um, ahead of them, and as we just celebrate around the table uh, when the Holy Spirit falls on us and on common gifts like bread and juice and help us to meet Jesus in those moments. Um, before we turn to our uh, season of celebrating graduates, uh, I did just have some news to share with you. Um, some of you already know this, but uh, early this morning, Fred Gilbert, a longtime member of our congregation, passed away. Um, it was a fairly sudden passing following an accident while Fred was bicycling on Friday evening. Um, and so please pray for Crystal and David Miller um, and their whole family at Fred's loss. Um, it has hit me pretty heavily and hard this morning. Uh, just last Sunday, Fred and I talked for a long time after worship um, and after our uh, quarterly conversation. Um, and for those of you who knew Fred, Fred was no nonsense. Fred was gruff. And you always knew what Fred was thinking, whether you wanted to or not. Uh, but Fred was a faithful follower of Jesus who loved um, his family and loved this church um, and loved others well. And so uh, I just want to pause for a moment to pray uh, for Fred's family before we move forward. Holy One, in the midst of life, we are in death. Where does our help come from? help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Even as we pause in the midst of worship to acknowledge a, a, a hole in our hearts this morning because Fred has gone on to glory, we also celebrate that the moment that he took his last breath on earth, he took his first breath in your presence for all eternity. And so comfort those who mourn, including those of us who are gathered here for worship this morning them in your love and remind us all of your great good news that even death does not have the final word in our lives. Life does. And so as we celebrate this day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and breathed new life into fearful disciples sending them out to share your word and the gospel in such powerful ways we praise you that your spirit breathes into us breath of life, even in these moments. We thank you for Fred's life. We thank you for his faith. And we thank you for the promises that he claimed that are now being experienced in all their fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. So it is a day of celebration, even in the midst of some sadness, and one of the th many things that we want to celebrate this morning is our graduates. We are blessed this year uh, to have received information from 10 of our graduates here uh, at Faith Church, and so I am going to just share briefly uh, a little bit about each of them as their pictures are shown on the screen, and then we are going to pray for them um, even as we send them off into the next season of their life. First of all, we celebrate that Jason Good, uh, graduating from Bloomsburg University, and now that Jason has graduated from college with a major in marketing and a minor in finance, he is currently seeking employment in those areas. Next, we celebrate Alexander Hotelling, graduating from Montoursville Area High School. And after graduation, Alexander plans to attend Penn State University and major in biomedical engineering. We celebrate Carly Larson, also graduating from Montoursville High School. And after graduation, Carly will be leaving for the U.S. Air Force in July as she fulfills her calling to serve her country in that way. We celebrate Jared Matlack, member of the graduating class of Montoursville High School, who will be attending Lock Haven University in the fall and uh, studying health and physical education for grades K through 12. We celebrate graduation for Elijah McBride, graduating from South Williamsport High School. Eli plans to attend Westchester University to double major 
in communication sciences and disorders and theater. We celebrate Kogan Metzger graduating from Commonwealth Charter Academy. Kogan will be attending Allegheny College of Maryland studying business administration and playing as part of their baseball team this fall. We celebrate Donovan Morse graduating from Loyal Sock High School. After graduation, Donovan will be taking a gap year and has already joined the workforce. We celebrate Ryan Shannon graduating from Montoursville High School. After graduation, Ryan will also be entering the workforce full time. We celebrate Caleb Shimko, son of our very own Pastor Joseph and Vicki, who is graduating from Loyal Sock High School. Caleb will be studying in the fall at the University of Kentucky in their College of Engineering while also playing the saxophone on Saturdays with the Wildcat Marching Band. And finally, this morning, we celebrate Stanley Showers, graduating from Montgom Montgomery Area High School. After graduation, Stanley will be entering the workforce at Keystone Friction Hinge Company. And I don't know about you, but when I look at this list of graduates, and as I think of the, the fact that they come from multiple different school districts, that they come from multiple different experiences, and that they are moving out into their next season of life in a variety of different ways, the military, uh, the workforce, continuing their education, serving, uh, I cannot help but give thanks and praise to God, not only for these young lives, but for the community of faith that has and continued, uh, will continue to nurture and nourish them. Uh, so will you join me just in that prayer? Holy and loving God, these young people are experiencing next steps in their life journey. They are leaving behind high school or college, and they are walking forward into work, into service, into furthering their education. And we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would continue to fall and fill them with your grace, with your joy, with your abundant life. We pray, thanking you for parents and grandparents, for teachers and staff, for a community of faith and friends who have helped get them to this point. And we pray that you would give us all the grace and the courage to continue to surround them, not only with our prayers, but with our hearts and our lives, that they might continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray your blessing upon them, and we give you thanks for their presence in our midst and in our life together. Praying in Jesus' name, amen. We all face moments. Our faith is tested. But in these moments of doubt, we find our strength in Christ. Rooted and built up in Him, we stand strong, unwavering, like a tree firmly planted, we hold fast, trusting His promises. For God is our refuge and our fortress, rooted in His unfailing love. We cannot be shaken.
For some series of messages, the timing of the sermons in a particular Sunday is beautiful and holy, and we can't help but look at the ways that it happens and think that must have been God all along. Like um, it, when we have been called to uh, preach about how to make the most of our lives on a Sunday when we had five students commit their lives to Christ through baptism and 12 students commit their lives to Christ and the church through confirmation. But there are other ways that the timing of a message on a particular Sunday seems kind of odd, like having to talk about suffering on Mother's Day, for instance, though pain and parenting do often go hand in hand, and we must rely on God to walk with us through it. Or like talking about the enemy after coming off of a week of rest on all Mason's first Sunday with us. And then there's this morning. On Pentecost, the birth of the church, as we celebrate high school and college graduates, I get to work and ask and walk through the question, how does God view money? And I think the irony is that many of those who are graduating from high school and especially college may not see much money anytime soon. <laughs> but my hope is that as we walk through this this morning that all of us might find some nuggets of wisdom to hold on to, uh, whatever part of life's journey we find ourselves in. Uh, so this morning with the words of scripture and some wisdom from one of the founders of our faith, John Wesley, uh, we're going to work to answer that question, how does God view money? So will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word contained in the stories and pages of scripture, contained in the words and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we thank you that when your Holy Spirit comes, you give your people the power to proclaim your word, to understand your word, and then to live your word in front of the world. And so that's what we pray for today. Speak to us through my words or in spite of them, but your servants are here listening, open for you to teach us and touch us, for you to challenge us, and for you to change us from the inside out. May that breath of life breathe on us. Amen. So, how does God view money? The first thing that we need to know about how God views money is that money isn't good or bad. It just is. One of the most misquoted verses in all of Scripture has to do with money, and it's recorded for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Folks often like to say that money is the root of evil. You've heard it said a hundred times, money is the root of all evil. But the Bible simply doesn't say that. Instead, it talks about the love of money, but isn't, that even isn't referred to as the root of all evil. What Paul actually writes to the church in words of caution against false teaching and in words of encouragement about being content with what we have are these words. Paul writes, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's important for us to know that money in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It simply is a way of living in the world that allows us to do good or bad with it. In a sermon that John Wesley preached back in the 1700s, he writes of money, the fault does not lie in the money, but in them that use it. It may be used ill, and what may not. But it may likewise be used well. It is full as applicable to the best as to the worst uses. But as John Wesley preached and wrote about the potential for good in money, he wrote these words. It is an excellent gift of God answering the noblest ends. In the hands of his children, money can be food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, raiment or clothing for the naked. He said money gives to the traveler and the stranger a place to lay their head, and by it we may supply the place of a husband to the widow and of a father to the fatherless. 
money isn't good or bad. It just is, depending on how the people of God use it. The second thing we know about money is that everything that we have belongs to God. We just steward it. Now, I've shared with you before that one of the most powerful prayers that has ever become a part of my life, a prayer practice that I have adopted over the last several years, is simply praying to God on a regular basis, I'm yours, Lord, that is all. Or praying these words, it's not mine. It's yours. Whatever that is, my life, my family, my relationships, the church that I love, the money that I have, the resources, the gifts, the skills, all of it, it's not mine, Lord, it's yours. If we as followers of Jesus are going to faithfully view money how God views it, and if we are going to use financial resources in a way that honors Jesus, then we must first come to the understanding that everything that we have belongs to God. Then our role with regard to our finances no longer lies as an owner, but as a manager. As a matter of fact, the scripture often uses the word to describe this management role. Scripture uses the word steward, to care for, to honor the owner with the way something is used. From the creation story in Genesis, as God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, they were given the role of stewarding creation. Knowing that all that they could see, animals that Adam was tasked with naming, the trees whose fruit would give them sustenance, the creation over which God would give them authority, it was all in the role of steward, caring well for something that they did not ultimately If we want to view money the way that God views money, if we want to use money in a faithful way, then we need to care well for something that ultimately never belonged to us in the first place. Now, I can hear some of you now. Pastor Larry, I work hard for my money. So hard for it, honey. Okay. It's been a long week. Um... I hear some of you saying, I've worked hard for everything I've ever gotten, so don't tell me that it all belongs to God and that it's all a gift from God. Now, the Donna Summer song notwithstanding, I recognize that every one of us could say with some level of passion that we have worked hard to achieve whatever level of financial stability or comfort we might have. And while I will often say that a whole lot of people have worked a whole lot harder than I have, so that I can do what I am called to do. From my parents, who came from incredibly humble circumstances to create a a more stable financial future for our family, to folks whose work regularly puts them in harm's way, to persons whose life circumstances, often not created by their choices, require them to work multiple jobs at less than living wages, simply to provide the necessities needed for survival. I also believe that I work hard in different ways to provide for my family. But here's the kicker. It's still not mine. No matter how hard I work or any of us work, the very ability to work is a gift from God. No matter how challenging my circumstances may have been growing up, I live in a part of the world where opportunity to grow into a different socioeconomic place was present. And I live in a country that provides imperfect but incredibly important safety nets to those who are the most vulnerable among us. And I didn't do a darn thing to earn or own any of that. Unless you look at it as simply a lucky coincidence, I can't look at it as anything less than a gift. So if that everything that I have is a gift, and everything that in, is entrusted to me belongs to God, then it makes sense that God should be a part of my decision making when it comes to using that money. A third thing that we know about money is that what we do with money both shows and shapes our heart. 
Now, this is where the wisdom of Jesus comes in. In the middle of this Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is talking about everything what, from what kind of life is going to be blessed, to forgiveness, to divorce, to true and false prophets, to prayer, in the middle of all of that in the Sermon on the Mount, he incorporates this teaching that Jim read for us this morning, specifically about our use of our resources and our money. And in challenging the natural tendency to which all of us are prone to gather more stuff and to build bigger barns to contain it all, Jesus reminds us that the treasures that show and shape our hearts aren't ultimately found in the things that can be held on earth at all, but in heaven. How we use our money shows our hearts, according to Jesus, because we simply don't have the ability to serve both God and money. It is often said that two ways that others could determine the highest priorities in our lives are simply by looking at our calendar and our checkbook. It's a hard truth. If you looked at our checkbook, you would see that our family makes a priority of giving regularly and generously. First to the church, and to other ministries and organizations that we feel bless the world, but it would also say that eating out, McDonald's, Diet Coke, and traveling get a whole lot more of this money that belongs to God than I would sometimes like to admit. You see, how we use money shows where our heart already is, but it doesn't just show our heart. How we use our money actually shapes our heart. This is how Jesus put it, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For a whole lot of years, I read that wrong. I used to think that what Jesus was saying is that where our heart is, that's where our treasure already is. Or that's where our treasure will go. Our treasure will follow our heart. But that's not really what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying where your treasure already is, that's where your heart's going to end up. So where are you using the resources that God's been entrusting to your care because how you answer that question will shape your heart and mind. So for instance, if I move into a home that leaves me what I call house poor, then there's a significant chance that my heart will follow by investing a whole lot of my time and energy into that home. If travel or a vacation home takes up a significant part of my financial gifts, then there is a likelihood that I will feel compelled to give an ever-growing part of my heart and time to that travel. If my kids' activities consume a huge portion of my spendable income, then it is very likely that those same in activities are going to determine how I spend my energy and my time and my heart. Now, I don't say any of this to make us feel guilty. I simply say it to encourage us all to ask the question, what does my use of God's resources show about my heart? And how may the way that I'm using those resources entrusted to my care be shaping my heart in ways that I don't even know? And so in the few minutes that I have left this morning, now that all of our eyes are sufficiently glazed over by all this money talk, I'm going to talk more about money, but I'm going to do it using the wisdom of John Wesley. He wrote a sermon in the 18th century called The Use of Money, and what he preached over 250 years ago is as relevant today. Now, it is important for us all to remember that when John Wesley was preaching particularly in the countrysides and the towns of England, he was preaching to people in every social and economic class who would listen. In 18th century England, that certainly included the kind of folks who lived in the extravagance of the castles that we see in our historical TV series, but it also included, often with more attention and with more effectiveness, those who were at the bottom of the financial food chain in his day and age. Time and again, Wesley is known to have preached at the entrances of the coal mines of the western British Isles to those who sought to eke out a meager living by the dangerous and often deadly work of mining. So wherever you find yourself this morning, 
uh, hear these words of encouragement from John Wesley, and I believe from God. First, John Wesley in that sermon said, gain all you can. Now, while Wesley cautioned that Christians are always called to earn their living in ways that honor God, in ways that honor their mind and body, and in ways that honor their neighbor, he nonetheless encouraged Christians to engage in work that allowed them to earn well. Wesley encouraged followers of Jesus to whom he was preaching to continually learn, to continually grow, to continually hone their skills and talents, and to continually practice what they were learning to make the most of their abilities and their financial opportunities. But while he encouraged followers of Jesus to gain all you can, we can't stop there because the next thing that he said to those same followers is then you need to save all you can. Now when he was challenging those believers to save all that they could, we need to hear it with different ears because when I hear someone say, save all that you can, I think about stockpiling financial resources. This isn't what that is about. It's about being diligent, about using money wisely, limiting expenses as much as possible regardless of what one earned. In an article on Christian history, a story is told of Wesley who was so convicted about a recent purchase that he had made as one of the women who worked for him didn't have enough to supply herself a coat in the cold winter weather. And in response to that conviction that he believed was from the Holy Spirit, we read this about Wesley. Perhaps as a result of this incident, in 1731, Wesley began to limit his expenses so he could have more money to give to the poor. He records that one year his income was 30 pounds and his living expenses were 28 pounds. And so he had two pounds to give away. The next year, his income doubled but he still lived on 28 pounds and gave 32 pounds away. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds, and again he lived on 28 pounds, giving 62 pounds away. The fourth year, he made 120 pounds, lived again on 28, and gave 92 to the poor. I don't know about you, but more often than not, when I have found my income increasing, I have been tempted and have fallen into the temptation to see that as an opportunity to spend more, whether I need it or not. I've been tempted to use God's resources to upgrade my experience with the latest technology, with a newer vehicle, with a better vacation. And again, none of these things are wrong in and of themselves. But we need to ask ourselves the question, how is God challenging us to save all that we can? And to what end? And that leads to Wesley's third point in the sermon when he said, give all you can. Now, Wesley's pretty clear and a little bit harsh in this assessment of those who choose to earn all they can and save all they can only to keep it for themselves. This is what he says. You may as well throw your money into the sea and bury it in the earth, and you may as well bury it in the earth as in your chest or in the Bank of England. Now, as ouchy as that may sound, Wesley simply encouraging the followers of Jesus to use the resources that they have gained and use the resources that they have been given to advance the purposes of the kingdom whose coming they prayed for every time they repeated the Lord's Prayer. So I'm not here this morning to tell you how much you should earn or how much you should spend or how much you should give. You need to know in complete transparency that conversation is a conversation that Barb and I have on a regular basis, and Barb, I think it would be safe to say that we've had some intense conversations about that last night. <laughs> so the timing of God in convicting the pastor, I'm not here to tell you any of that. What I do want to do is simply encourage you and to encourage me to regularly check in with God and check in with others about God's view of money and specifically the money that we have been entrusted to care for. And then having done all of that, I want to leave you with this encouragement from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, 
and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now it would be perfectly natural for me as a pastor to now move into our offering time. <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. Instead, we're going to receive together the gifts of God. As we gather around this table, we are reminded again that everything that we have is a gift from God. The breath that we're breathing in in these moments, the salvation that was paid for with Christ's life, the community of faith that we get to celebrate and walk alongside, the hope that we have. And so as we gather around this table to receive, we tell the story, and the story is this, that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave it to his disciples after breaking it and after thanking God for it, and he said to his disciples, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then at, after that supper was over, he took one of the cups at the table and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we remember these mighty acts of God in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as that holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, receiving these gifts, we say, I'm yours, God. That's it. And we pray, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ. Make us one with each other. And make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the broken body of Christ. Because Christ has been broken, we can be made whole. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ, reminding that just as Christ poured himself out for us, we might be filled with grace to pour ourselves out for others. This morning we'll be receiving communion by intention. There will be two stations here in the front of the sanctuary. For those who are comfortable, we invite you to walk down the center aisle. You'll be given a piece of bread. You'll be invited to dip it into the juice and receive those gifts of God. For those of you who have more difficulty walking, please stay where you are, and we will be glad to bring communion to you. And for those who are still more comfortable uh, not receiving from a common bread and a common cup, um, there are packaged elements individual um, in the rear of the sanctuary. At this point, I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Joseph and Lisa and those who will be serving communion to come forward and receive those gifts of God. As we watch this video and as we prepare our hearts to receive together.
God given for all the people of God. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, and we pray that you would raise us up in the strength of your spirits to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now will you stand as we sing together our closing hymn. talk about money and I don't take the offering. Oh Sweet baby Jesus, that was my friend. So we are going to take the offering while we sing our last hymn. See that I planned all along. So if our ushers would come forward and let us sing together. Yep, we're going to do the last hymn. We might have to sing it four times to get through the offering, but we'll do it.
God, we give you thanks for all of it, for life, for love, for laughter, for the community, and for our salvation, given so freely and with so much love. And so we offer our gifts to you, and we offer our lives to you. Receive this benediction. Knowing that God has loved you since the very foundations of the world, as you were formed in your mother's womb, every step along life's journey. Go, living in that love, sharing that grace, and being the generous people of a generous God.